Okay, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. For those of us who are who didn't come last week, we've started the book of Exodus, and we're on chapter 2. Last week we covered how God wants to call us out of Egypt, and how Egypt doesn't just represent slavery of sin, but sometimes it represents the relaxed, comfortable, uh, life lacking zeal and so that God wants to bring us out of Egypt that we would be out of that like lazy life of comfort thing that, that kind of prevents us from going deep and then we, we spoke about how God teaches us to taste the, the rottenness of the world or the rottenness of Egypt because Egypt represents the world and all its luxuries and all its comforts that God wanted us to taste the, the, the terrible taste that the world has to, to give. Now we're on Exodus chapter 2, so if you can open up your Bibles. <clears throat> and I just want to read from verses 1 to 10. Actually, if somebody can read for us from 1 to 10. Who doesn't mind reading? And a man of the house of Levi went and took, a, went, took as a wife, daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of, of bulrushes for him, daubed it with, with asphalt and pitch, put that child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew's children. Then his, children's, then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may knit? that she may nurse the child for you. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and, she became her, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. So right before this passage, we read last week that Pharaoh had ordered that all of the male children would be killed, would be thrown into the river, and destroyed. At a time, as the enemy was preparing to destroy God's people, this was the time that God brought forth his deliverer. And it's the same thing with our with Christ and His incarnation. Some of the fathers say that the man could not have taken sin or the punishment of sin any longer. That if, if Christ didn't come at the time that He came, all of men would have died in sin and all of Israel and all His people were, were, were going to be hopeless. And so, same time, that as the enemy was planning to destroy all of God's people, God was preparing for himself or brought forth himself, Moses, as, as the deliverer of his people. And this mother, as the baby was born, she looked into the face of Moses. And it was as if God had whispered something in her heart that made her see something special. Of course, every mother looks to their newborn baby and thinks that their baby is the most beautiful baby in the world. But here, it says, And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. Something in her told her that this, 
that God's like affection is on this child, that God has put his hand on this child that this child has 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 a purpose that God wants to fulfill through him. And she was encouraged to take this little baby and to go against the edict of Pharaoh. She prepared a basket. She put little baby Moses in this river and she put him in the river and she didn't have this fear that most people would have. She did not fear what it was that Pharaoh commanded. And if, she were, if they were to find out that she did this, possibly she could be killed, her husband could be killed, her other children could be killed for disobeying Pharaoh and trying to flee from, from what Pharaoh had commanded. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. Hebrews chapter 11 is the, is the hall of faith in which you see all the, all the great heroes of faith. And St. Paul writes, and he says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. This great act of faith by the mother shows that she was immovable. She believed that nothing, nothing was going to destroy God's eternal purposes. God was going to use, she had this, this belief that God was going to do something for this child. And you have to understand, it had been told them before that after 400 years of people being in slavery, that God was going to deliver his people. And he said this in Genesis chapter 15, in Genesis chapter 15 to Abraham. And so the people of Israel started to realize, okay, it's been 400 years. This might be the time. They had this faith that God was not going to leave them. So she said, let me just hold on to this kid. Let me do whatever it takes to protect she believed that greater was he that was for her than he that was in the world. Do we, God's people, have this faith? Do we have this faith that God is going to carry out his perfect purposes through us? He's going to carry them out through us and that he, no matter what edict comes out by whoever's mouth, I don't care how powerful this man may be, this woman had faith in God's promises. She, her faith, could not be shaken. She believed God was not going to leave his people. How many times do, do we lose faith and we think that sometimes God has forgotten us? God has forgotten us. God is overlooking my problem and God just doesn't understand. As she was raising the baby for three months, she was taking care of the baby for the first three months and all of a sudden she realized like, the baby's cries were getting louder. She couldn't hide him anymore. So what did she do? She took the baby. She put him in this basket. And she put him in the river. And she put him in the river, having some faith that God was going to do something. I don't know what it is, but I believe that God is not going to allow this beautiful child to be slaughtered. And I think... It's almost like she was holding on to the faith that Abraham had. When Abraham went and God had called Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, that at the last moment, God in his mercy sent his angel to stop Abraham. She thought that maybe, somehow, God in his providence and his goodness was going to protect this baby from death. Abraham himself thought that even if I kill this baby, it says in Hebrews chapter 11, that even if I kill him, I believe that God will raise him from the dead. It is this immovable faith. I wish I could see this, this type of faith in God's people. This type of faith that says, no matter what happens, I don't care what affliction might be coming my way, I am going to cast my cares upon him because I believe that he cares for me. And his sister, Moses' sister Miriam, waited by the banks of the river. They had no doubt something was going to happen. They believed that God was going to intervene, just like it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 20, all things work together for good 
to those that love God, to those that were called, into, called according to His purpose. Do you believe that God has a purpose for you, number one? And number two, that no matter what it seems is going on in your life, it seems that maybe your trials are too big, that your problems are too big, that your affliction is too much, do you have the faith that God at the end, somehow by some miraculous way, is going to intervene? I think many of God's children forget the great abilities God has for His children. So many of us forget what God can do. We think that God, or we think that God only can do what a really strong man can do. But when will we believe in God that He can do the things that only God can do? He could do the impossible. And what happens? The baby goes down the river, by chance, this is not by chance, this is by God's providence, that the Pharaoh's daughter saw him, not saw him and said, oh my gosh, a Hebrew baby, let's kill him. Because my dad said we should kill all Hebrew babies, or all Hebrew males. That God could even stir the heart of Pharaoh's daughter. Do you believe that God can do the impossible? Do you still believe that God does the impossible? That when you pray for whatever is going on in your life, that you believe that God can do something supernatural? A couple of weeks ago, a, a young man called me. He's about to get married to a lady that his parents didn't seem to approve of. But this young lady, externally or from the outside, maybe her situation may not be the ideal for his parents to accept her. But this young girl ended up, she she's, wasn't a member of the church, ended up meeting like four different priests and every single one of these priests approved of this girl that he would be able to marry her and that go ahead. The bishop sat with her for several hours, approved, said this girl's great, go ahead, you have my blessing. Parents said, I don't care who said what. We don't want to meet her. We don't want to see her. We are not going to your wedding. The wedding is actually this weekend from another place. And he came and he was crying to me saying, I don't want to go without the blessing of my parents. And he was crying and said, my parents won't even give it a chance. It's impossible. I'm getting married next week. For the, they, they haven't wanted to meet her for the last two years. What are the chances? And when I read this, I began to think that when is God going to give such a powerful faith to His people that, that we believe that God, even in the last minute, can do something supernatural? I don't know what supernatural happened, but I had instructed Him. I said, I want you to fast for three days. I want you to pray, and I want you to do a matanya, do a prostration, one for your mom, one for your dad, every day for the three days. And I want you to call upon one of the saints to intercede for you. He was looking at me, saying, Abuna, I'm getting married next week. I'm not going to fast. I'm not going to, like, I said, just trust me. Fast and, and God will do the supernatural. He says, my parents haven't even met her yet. There's no way that they're going to meet her after the first time and come to the wedding. I got a call a few days ago. Something supernatural happened. I don't know what happened, what stirred in the parents' hearts. He hadn't talked to them through all of this. They decided that they wanted to invite her over for dinner. They wanted to meet her. They fell in love with her. And they're planning going to the wedding. God can do supernatural things. But we as his people have just come to the realization, Rabbina stopped doing great miracles. God stopped doing big things. I pray that God's people will once again stir up their faith like this woman that would put her innocent three-month-old in a basket down a river and trust that somehow, I don't know how, but somehow, if I put this baby in this river, God is going to do something. Most people would say, you put the baby in the river, might as well kill the baby. It's the same thing. But her faith showed something else. Her faith, she believed in the supernatural. We need the faith that trusts in the power of God's plan that always prevails. Then you look and you say, 
Why? Why all these tough things that the, the Hebrews had to go through and, and this poor mother who had to put her child in the river and all this stuff, this beautiful child. I was reading the fathers and they said if it wasn't for the extreme measures of the repression coming from Pharaoh, the child would have never been exposed. If little Moses was just born in any normal circumstances, circumstance, that Moses would have just been born into the family, he just would have been a nice little Hebrew kid. But because of this repression, God had stirred it in her heart that she would put him in the river because there was no other option and that the Pharaoh's daughter was going to capture him or take him, allow him to be nursed again by his mother and he was going to be given, he was going to be learning all the greatest wisdom that Egypt had to offer because he was raised obviously in Pharaoh's palace. God wanted Moses to be exposed. God wanted to build up Moses so he allowed and he he would allow that all these hard times would come that Moses would be exposed. If he had never been launched in the river, Moses would have never, would have missed out from the, from the education that St. Stephen talked about in Acts chapter 7. He says that he was given all the wisdom of the Egyptians. The Egyptians at the time, we were talking about last time, were the most intellectual, they were the most knowledgeable, they were the most in tune with like the the astronomy and all that stuff, they were in tune with the stars and the moon and all this stuff. Moses was given this wisdom and he was invested in because God had a great plan for Moses. God also uses the bad for good. God uses hard circumstances in our life for good. He intends for them to come out in good. Or even just bad things. What about what Judas did? If it wasn't for the betrayal of Judas, and you're saying, well, okay, now poor Judas lost his soul. Judas had the choice. But if it wasn't, God was able to turn Judas's bad, wicked choice into salvation for all. So the hard times or the tough times in your life, God uses them for good. The, the repression that Moses' mother was feeling, it was used for the investment in Moses. Do you believe that God is investing in you? Do you believe that God is investing in your life and building up your character through the hard times that you go through? Because it is, it is God's permission that all this comes forth so that we would, be, would learn and be strengthened in our character. To think what an amazing reversal of the situation. That Pharaoh's plans changed by the action of his own daughters. That the freedom or the emancipation of his own slaves was going to be somebody that was raised in his own palace. How God can turn bad into good. That even Pharaoh, who gave the, the edict to kill all these males, is the one that was raising the emancipator of all these Hebrew slaves. How God is working mysteriously in our lives, sometimes we can't see it. Now, this is a strong me message for all parents. This woman put her child in the basket in the river and she cast off her child in the hands of God. Anybody who is entrusted with nurturing or caring for younger people, maybe you're serving young people, it is so important that you learn to cast these young children into the hands of God. To cast what you feel like God has entrusted you and put them in the hands of God because you believe that God cares, that He cares for these young children. So many families find themselves raising their kids in tough environments, in, in bad moral climates where you find that here in America every kid might be doing God knows what in school and drugs and immorality and all kinds of things and these parents are thinking how am I going to raise my children in such an environment let us take the example of Moses' mother who cast off her child in the hands of God trusting that no matter what the environment God was going to care for him 
God lives and loves and cares for you and He cares for these children and we have to believe that. I think sometimes we think that God is in His own world and we are in our own world and we forget that sometimes maybe the young child that parents love to death, you forget that even, even David said in the Psalms that when my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will never forsake me. That the greatest love comes from God Himself. There's a lot to learn, a lot of lessons to learn from Mo Moses' mother. More than even Miriam's eyes that went along the bank to follow him to find out where he was going to go, God's eyes were upon Moses. He cared so much for him. Now his life was saved, and he was nursed from his mother and received the teachings that he needed. So what happened was, Pharaoh's daughter took the baby. Little Miriam came and said, do you want me to find a Hebrew nurse to come and to nurse him? She said, fine, go ahead and do that. It was those young, those few months that she was nursing Moses and probably whispering in his ears the commands of God or the promise and the covenant that God gave to his people Abraham that God is going to bless all the seed of Abraham. She held on to the promises of God. The importance of feeding our children and 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 giving them the word of God even from a young age. It is so important that, that, we, that we learn that even what she planted in this baby in the few months, let's just say it was a year, let's just say it was two years of nursing and caring for this child, that it was what she planted in his heart from that young age that made him realize that the Jews were his brethren. And we're going to see that later on. It was from the young age of what his mother taught him that was planted in him that came to fruition that gave him the love for his people. And then if you turn to Acts chapter 7 verse 22. Just real quick. And it says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians as he was being raised in the palace and was mighty in words and deeds. Don't forget this line, that he was mighty in words and deeds, for next week. Next week, when we hear the calling of Moses, we're going to see that how it was, how this line kind of gives us a, a deeper understanding um, as to, to Moses' conversation with God during his calling at the, at the burning bush. Josephus says that Moses became, Josephus was a, is a, a Jewish historian, who became a powerful soldier who led the Egyptian troops against the Ethiopians. God, in Moses being in the palace, was building up Moses. He was building up his skills. He was building up his leadership and that he could lead the armies of Egypt in fighting against the Ethiopians. How much God was planting in him, building up his characteristics and his virtues. Now let's turn to Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. The key word in this verse is his brethren. That Moses, who was raised in the most luxurious place in the whole world who was given the most pampered upbringing his whole life could look to slaves those who were beggarly slaves and look to them and consider them his brethren here is a type of Christ in that Christ himself who in his glow off of his glorious throne saw our burdens the burden of sin and he felt compassion for our sins, which is why he stepped down to the earth for the salvation of mankind. He became man and taught us the ways of salvation. Do you think that God overlooks your burdens? Here Moses looked at his brethren and he had compassion on his brethren. How much more does God have compassion on your burdens? How about you as a believer? Do you look to your brethren 
and see their burdens and notice their burdens. I think sometimes we are raised in a culture where it's almost every man for himself. Every man care for himself and become the greatest that you can be. When Moses, who was becoming the greatest that any man could be, was looking to his slave brethren. It says, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. He looked and he could feel compassion on his brethren. Do you notice the burdens of your brethren, the poor? Do you notice the burdens of the sick, the hungry, the lonely? Christ said in Matthew chapter 25 from 35 to 40, he says, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did to one of the least of these my brethren. Christ, the king of kings and the God of gods, could look to the lowest or the least of his people and consider them his brethren. Do you have this heart? Can you look to the character of Moses, who was nursed with the church's milk, in which we are, nurtured, we are nursed with the church's milk that teaches us the ways of God? Has it taught you how to live like him and to care for the burdens of others? So many people, it was weird, somebody was recently telling me, it was sad, after that Nag Hammadi massacre, somebody was saying, Okay, but like we're here in America, like we have our own lives to live. And I was thinking there could have been no more insensitive comment that I could have possibly heard it come out of somebody's mouth than to look at our brethren in Egypt and say, but like, look, we're here in America, we, you know, we're free and we can do whatever we want. And I was looking to this person like, how cold-hearted have we become? How cold-hearted have we become that we have forgotten to carry the burdens of others? When Christ said, Take up your cross and follow me. When Christ, Abu Shoy Kamal said, whose cross was Christ carrying? He was carrying our cross. So that when Christ tells us to carry our cross, he's talking about carrying the cross of others, carrying the burdens of others, just as, as Moses did. Make sure that you're not living in your own bubble. In Acts chapter 7, verse 23, this visit to his people, when he went down, I think was life-changing. Acts chapter 7, verse 23. Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. When he visited, his eyes were open and his heart was changed. So many people, when they go to Africa or they go to Egypt or they go to wherever and they see how people are living. For example, uh, an earthquake just happened in a country not too far from us. And over a million people were displaced. I think over 200,000 people were killed. I don't know what the number of the toll is right now, but hundreds of thousands of people were killed. And I wonder if any of us thought any differently. If we carried our course of life any differently, knowing that some catastrophe wiped out 200,000 people. All of America was turned upside down during the terrorist attacks when 3,000 people were killed. Imagine a country of a million and a half people displaced, starving because of a natural catastrophe and killed. It's important that we again we as believers become sensitive. We become sensitive to what might burden even the heart of God. In Hebrews chapter 11 from 24 to 26, it says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the, treasures, than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. This is why God chose 
Moses. Because Moses, who though he was living in Egypt, did not consider himself of Egypt. Though you are living in the world, I pray that you are not of the world. That God does not look to me and my heart and say, his heart is the same as everyone else in the world. Moses was special. That he could be living in the most glorious palace in the whole world and yet look to his people and say he preferred, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to su suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Look at this character of Moses. That he would prefer that he would not be considered Pharaoh's son. Moses looked at the dim hope of being their deliverer. He was hope, hoping that maybe, just maybe, God could use me. Knowing that he was in the palace. And he attempted. He attempted, as we just read. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Verse 12. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses had this slight hope that maybe I could free the, the Hebrews. I could free the Jews. He felt like maybe God could use, he could use me. Now it says he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. But it says before that, he looked this way and that way. We thought maybe in the heat of the moment, Moses just gave the Egyptian one good pow to the nose and knocked him out and killed him. It was it was obviously premeditated that he looked this way and that and did everything he could in order. He was trying to take matters into his own hand. He was trying to save the people himself. And we're going to see at the problem and why that's a problem. St. Gregory of Nyssa says, The fight between the Egyptian and the Hebrew is like a battle between injustice against righteousness, or arrogance against humility. And so Moses decided, decided by virtue, or so, or he's, I'm sorry, he decided to kill the advers adversary of virtues. He decided to kill the enemy of what was good. And so the fathers looked at what he did as something virtuous. But of course, Virtuous, virtuous out of his good intention. But because he took matters into his own hand, where did it end up? He thought maybe this Jewish person was going to be so grateful for him that he did this. He thought there's no way he would tell anyone. Well, next morning, wakes up. Verse 13, And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? Then he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. It was the act of a good intention, but unfortunately it was lacking the guidance and the control of his spirit. How many things that we do out of good intentions? Moses, out of the goodness of his heart, tried to help this poor Hebrew slave that was probably getting beat down unjustly because an Egyptian thought maybe he was feeling like he wanted to hurt one of the Hebrews. And so Moses, out of the good intention of his heart, decided to do something. But when your good intentions are not matched with the guidance and the discernment of the Holy Spirit, it's only going to lead you into problems. So it is important that we are always in tune with the Holy Spirit and that we are always being filled through prayer of the Holy Spirit and through the partaking of His sacraments. It is important that you are filled always with His Spirit. Yes, many of us have good hearts and many of us have good intentions. We want to do things that are good. But sometimes it results in bigger problems because we aren't using the wisdom that comes from God. And they said, who made you a prince over us? Basically saying, who made you a savior? It was at this point that Moses became broken. He realized, I tried to do something good. Now, 
Pharaoh wants to kill me. So he ends up fleeing and becoming broken. When a servant wants to be a savior, I'm sorry, when a servant thinks that he's a savior, it is then that God reveals to that servant that he is in need of salvation. And when a servant realizes that he is in need of salvation, it is then that God will use him to be a savior or a deliverer. That's an important thing for every servant to know. That when you think that you are going to be a savior, God is going to make it very clear that you are in need of salvation before anyone. And that when you realize that you are in need of his salvation and you are broken, you are humble, it is then that God will use you as his deliverer for his people. St. Peter says in in 1 Peter chapter 4, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. This is where Moses went wrong. He was using his own strength. He thought that by his mighty hand, he could save the, the, the Hebrews. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case because God was not behind it. It was in vain. If God's hand of blessing is not working through you in your life, whether it be in your career, in your studies, in your marriage, in your family life, if it is not God's hand that is with you and you are doing it from your own strength, no matter what your efforts are, they are going to be in vain. It is important for every student, for every wife and husband and family and anybody who is pursuing their career, if you are doing it on your own, it's going to be in vain. Let God supply you with the power and the grace that is needed. And then we go on. In verse 16, now the priest, so he flew to Midian and he sat down by a well. In verse 15. In verse 16, now the priest of Midian and seven, now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and held them and watered their flock. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, how is it that you have come so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. There goes Moses again, trying to use his might to save these poor Hebrew, or these poor Midianite women. God, in this time that he was in Midian, was going to have to change his character, was going to have to work a lot while he was going to be in the deserts of Midian. God was going to be training him and building him up because this nature that was in him, there was so much self. It was so much of of the self or of his ego that he wanted to save the Hebrew, that he wanted to save the, the priest's daughters. This is just a sign of showing how much his, his nature was, was very full of self. So he said to his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Verse 21, then Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moses. And she bore him a son. He called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. When anybody names their baby Gershom because he considered himself a stranger, this isn't my home, it gives a sign of his brokenness. This is not where I should be. God intended for his brokenness because it is only by one's brokenness that God's pure aroma can come out of you. The same thing, when the, broke, when, the, when the woman brought her alabaster flask and broke it, it was then that she was able to anoint the feet of Christ and that sweet aroma was able to come out of the flask. You know, the only way to get the aroma out of the flask was by breaking it. It wasn't like a bottle that you can just pour out. So it's the same thing. God sometimes works in us so that we become broken When we become and realize that we are nothing and we're in our brokenness, it is then that God can use you. But He can't use you as long as you have so much self. 
We must be flexible in his hand. We must be free with him to, to use us. And she bore him a son. He called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God, God acknowledged them. God here is preparing for them their deliverer. And we're going to hear about his calling next week. I pray that we can just, everyone can try to read the passages before and try to maybe meditate on them before. Exodus is full of treasures. And the whole Old Testament and the whole New Testament keeps on referring back to what happens here in the book of Exodus. So if you're not reading a, a, a book in the Bible right now alongside your quiet times, I, I would highly encourage you to go and read Exodus. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Anyone have any questions or comments? Let's stand and pray.